Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming here today. We have the Honorable Representative Keith True now here. Standing here before us, he is here to answer any questions about. He is running for District uh, District 13, if I'm mm -hmm. correct yep. on there. That is for State Senate. He is an experienced man who has lived in Lake County for quite a little bit. So, uh, he is not exactly new to this whole sort of thing. So, please do ask any <laughs> questions that could obviously help him get more of information on who he is out there for this new seat. Or, if you have questions that you have from the past, we appreciate that as well. Uh, so, we're going to give him, like she said, 15 minutes to really explain his platform on there and then go through and actually be able to give an explanation of it. Uh, Mr. Trunet. Thank you, Jeremiah. Thanks for coming this morning. Um, most of you know who I am already, um, but I'll, I'll recap where I come from and, and how I got here. So, I was born in Minnesota, 1969. My family, I come from a fam, family of farmers. Uh, my grandparents farmed and their grandparents before them and then before them. And then from Germany and Austria. So I, uh, My parents moved to Florida in 1979 and bought a farm in Webster, Florida, chicken farm. Some, some uh, representative Chuck Clemens says from the from the chicken farm to the state, state <laughs> farm. Um, you, we um, started off there, and my parents had had the farm there in Webster for many years, and we ended up moving to Leesburg in my high school years, and graduated from Leesburg High in 1987. I graduated one year after the sheriff. He graduated in 86 with my brother Mark, many of you know my brother Mark, Lake Dorn Trim. Um, so after graduating in 1987, at 17 years old, I got my parents to sign off for me to join the United States Air Force. So I joined the Air Force at 17, turned 18 in boot camp. I served a term in the Air Force and uh, came back to Lake County and went back to farming again. Uh, farmed in Leesburg, we grew turf grass and grew some row crops and then ended up in Zellwood in 1993. Went to work for a, a row crop farmer that grew sweet corn in Zellwood, uh, Wilkinson Cooper Produce. Uh, Ellis Wilkinson was his name. So I worked for him for about seven years and he passed away and I ended up buying his business out and starting my own thing in 1998, my wife and I. Uh, a lot of times people ask me what I do. My, I, I grow grass and my wife sells drugs. <laughs> she, she's a pharmacist for 28 years. Uh, met her in 95 and got married in 2000. We have two boys, uh, Dylan and Ashton, 19. Dylan's 19, going to Lake Sumter State College and working at the college part-time in the media department. Um, my younger son is in high school, he's a junior in high school at Mount Dora Christian Academy. Both boys went to Mount Dora Christian Academy and most of their time my oldest left Mount Dora Christian Academy and went to Montverde to finish out his high school years. He's a musician, he plays piano and writes music and sings and does a lot of those things. We encourage our kids to explore what, what they want to explore. Um, that's a short of it as far as family goes. I mean, there's a lot more to it than that, but what brought me to this point in my life? Uh, before becoming the representative, uh, I sold my business to an equity group, which I still own part of. So I don't run day to day. So I have a lot of time on my hands to, to do other things. And uh, Representative Jennifer Sullivan was in this seat before I took this seat, or I ran for this seat. And as you all know, I'm I'm a pretty principled guy, but I'm I'm also purposed. I don't I don't do things that you know. I'm not doing things for personal gain or personal pleasure or things like that. I mean, I, I, I'm here to get some things done 
So I ran on a platform of, of uh, faith, family, service to country, understanding what, what our needs are here and, and you know go to Tallahassee and get the job done. So you all elected me in 2020 and sent me to Tallahassee. And in those four years, I think we've accomplished great things. I mean, there's always room for improvement for a host of things. And we chip away at things every year to, to make things better. And we can talk about, we can talk about abortion and how we, we got to the 15-week ban. And then the next session, we got to the six-week ban. We chipped away at you know things that matter to us and life matters to us. Um, this, 15-week ban bill still in the court system trying to work its way through. So as as things go, you all know this is not an easy task to get things done, but that's just an example of how we chip away at getting, getting what needs to be done done. Now on the other hand, that, that also leads you to a problem or an issue or some things to take care of when you talk about women and babies being born into this world. How many people? How many babies are not born into this world because of the abortion rules that are in place today? And there's thousands, tens of thousands of babies that are born and not born into this world. Now we, we're going to get that opportunity to have those children born into this world. So we have to be ready for those babies to be born. And yes, it is the family's duty to take care of their children. But you know as well as I do, there's reasons why those people don't have children or are not wanting to have children. So we have to be ready to make sure we can accommodate for them and we can help support that family unit so that they have an opportunity to take care of that child. So in the last couple of years we've been setting setting it up for that to come, right? So we set, set aside some money to take care of those mothers and babies. Um, and then in this in this session we, we did it even more it's in the Live Healthy Act that was passed this year. So. If you read that, you'll see a lot about birthing centers and how we can help manage what's coming. Because I think that's the most important part. As we chip away at trying to take care of those issues that are near and dear to our heart, then we also make sure that we accommodate for that as it comes. Um, um, my first year I, I was uh, the proud sponsor of a bill that has made its way into the hearts and minds of all, all Floridians, and that's the Wildlife Corridor Act. So the Wildlife Corridor Act was my first year. I got to run, run, run that, sponsor that legislation. It didn't start off that way. It started off as a little bill called the Little Wakaiva Study Act. Or it was, we had to change the title. So as we were moving along, some folks came to us about the Wildlife Corridor, and that was a vehicle. If you know how bills run in the, in the House or the Senate, you can amend them, you can amend the amendment, or you can change or revise things as they move along. So it got a little bit of horsepower. So the Wildlife Corridor Act was attached to that bill, and with that came $400 million the first year. So as a freshman, I, I got to run a piece of legislation that would change the way we look at Florida and how we preserve land in Florida. And really I call it the Endangered Species Act. In my opinion, it, the most endangered species is, what do you think the most endangered species is? Anybody got an idea? The white uh, male. The, the, the panther. I think, I think it's the Florida property. farmer. Oh, the Florida uh, farmer, uh, yeah, for sure. So They moved to Germany. <laughs> so the Florida <laughs> farmer in the lands that we grow crops on in Florida is in danger of being gone. So the Florida Wildlife Act created a mechanism in which with Florida Forever to accommodate that, right? So $400 million was set aside in, in that the first year and another $300 million the next year and on and so on. Up, up to date, four years later, almost $2 billion has been set aside to preserve lands in Florida. So that little Wakaiva bill that got started just to look at some little problem, which it still got looked at, turned into something monumental, and, and that's just the beginning. But as you know, 
when you get successful at doing things in the Florida House or the Senate, that comes with responsibility. When my second term, my first year, before the second term began, the speaker called me and said, congratulations, you're now chairman of criminal justice. And I go, yes, sir. Uh, from a farmer who's never had any experience with criminal justice or judicial system, I, I kind of was curious, you know, why, why me? Um, the speaker is a, is a veteran himself. The chairman of judiciary is a veteran. I'm a veteran, so there was some continuity, but there was also continuity in, in common sense, in how we govern ourselves, and how we move through the system, and handle, handle ideas, and come up with solutions, and, and make progress. And he, he believed that I, I was the guy for the job. And in that two years, I had to establish how I would look at things. So I have no idea about, you know, about a lot of things in, in law. So in the judiciary silo, there's about eight attorneys that were really, really good people. They would give me all the details on how things are put together and how ideas touch different statutes from different places, and we would come up with the solutions and how the bills would be moved forward. The most bills of any committee in the Florida House, or any committee, period, is criminal justice. Mm. This year alone, we had over 120 bills come across my desk, and I'm the first line of defense. So anything that came across my desk, we had to, we had to engage and decide whether we move that piece of legislation forward or not. So as things go, 51 pieces of legislation made it through the committee and on to the next committee. Some of those didn't make it past the second committee or third committee, but those that's how many pieces came across my desk. Not only did I have those 120 plus bills, I had seven of my own bills to run. So I had ideas that needed to happen there. So a lot of, like I said, when you become successful in the Florida House or the legislature, they give you more responsibility. And if you're up for the task, you accomplish it or you don't. Meanwhile, I, I worked on a lot of other environmental pieces over the years. One you all are probably pretty familiar with is the Lake County Water Authority, changing the way the trajectory of the committee, that, that special district was set up and, and put it back under the Board of County Commissioners, which was a huge undertaking, as you know, seven elected officials now not there anymore and, and you know, changing the way we do business with the Lake County Water Authority. Mm -hmm. uh, reducing the amount of money we spend and, and, and putting the burden back on the state government for their share and then the Board of County Commission because they, they are the people that, will, that control the budgets, right, for the, for the county. So. A lot of great things have come from that. The Parks and Rec Department has taken over the properties and, you know, made them more accessible for all of us. And in, in the end, they've done, made some adjustments in, in their, how they run the NERF program out at Lake Popkin that's been highly successful in reducing the cost by about half. So we're still working on new and innovative ideas about how we can clean water in, in Lake County with that system or or how we move forward with that, but those, those, that's a very big piece of legislation that, that we had to move forward. Going back to, going back to uh, criminal justice, you know, in criminal justice we had, we had some Second Amendment right bills that came through my committee. Uh, you, you, you guys all followed them. You, you even sent me up a, a piece of paper telling you what your where agendas were. And you know that out of the four gun bills, three of those bills were agended in my committee and passed through my committee. Um, not always do we get everything we want when we, when we work on legislation, but we, we work hard to figure out what the best route is and get the momentum to make, make policy move, and we did that. What I will tell you is I, I'm here to uphold the integrity, the professionalism, 
the dignity of, of the office, of the office of representative or the office of state senator. I mean, I'm here because I believe that, that the, the level of experience that I've had over the years, good or bad, failures, successes, all help us make better decisions in life that affect us as people, family, children, property, businesses, all those things that make things grow. I mean, there is so much that we've done in the last four years that we've accomplished that are so good. Not, not that we've accomplished it all, because we have. There's more to be done. But I think that uh, I thank the leadership in the Florida House for recognizing me for the, the skill set that I bring to, to the legislation legislature. Um, and, you know, I, I can't say enough. I mean, I think that we've been surrounded here in this county for the first time in many, many years with a delegation that works hard for us. Spends more time than any previous representatives or senators that I've seen in a long time. Not to mention, you know, the appropriations that I've been able to accomplish bringing back for workforce training, um, Lake Tech College, I brought back 16 billion plus for that workforce program. Lake Sumter State College just last year, 17.5 million dollars for their workforce training program. And then this year established in the legislature a hundred million dollar grant block for alignment of workforce training from pre-K through 12 through Votech and Lake Sumter College system to line up. So if any of those entities want to pull from that grant funding, they can pull from that hundred million dollar grant funding to help align so children as they grow up can figure out what they want to do. Not everyone needs to go to college right away. These things, these tools are in the toolbox to get them started in their life to be safe, productive, family, children producing folks. I mean, you know, our next business leaders are coming out of there. So, I'm, I'm humbled to be your representative. I'm happy to be here. Um, I don't take this lightly and not one bit. I, I, I go to work every morning. The chairman of the judiciary, uh, Tommy Gregory, would say, between seven and eight is true now hour, because I'm the only one who shows up at seven o'clock every morning, because I, I like to get my day started early and figure out what, what my plan is. But with that, we'll go into questions. That's awesome. Right. Thank you very much, sir. I say, a farmer and you definitely got you waking up early more than most people would be. <laughs> well, Can I say something right off before oh, questions? Mm -hmm. I, I was at the town of Ethel over near the Wakiva River that was brought up between Lake County and the state. And I was told, and I was so impressed that the state has helped with Lake County and Orange and Seminole to uh, preserve 45,000 acres over in that section for Florida and for us. And so that is part of what he was saying about preserving the land, and I think that's a great thing. It's a wonderful, it's old Florida, it's wonderful, and I thank you very much for what you've done on that. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Well, to, to that end, there's a line item appropriation that made it through for Apopka. Not that it touches us in Lake County, but it does touch us, mm -hmm. meaning preserving the corridor. There's a piece of property. Uh, it's, it's the Wacabo Cala Greenway acquisition, and and it's in front of the governor for two point five million dollars. Wow, nice, great, right. right. nice, nice. Very nice. So, in appropriations wise, not just for for Lake County, but I I did some other things, feeding Florida and, and those things, uh, making sure that people have something to eat. All in total, we're at twenty million dollars from my silo. So I've been blessed mm -hmm. again. Responsibility, the things that you do, this is what happens. When you when you get when you get that done and you work hard for the people of Florida, you get rewarded. And we've been rewarded for four years straight mm -hmm. right. on appropriations coming back to Lake County. Yeah. And 
Representative Yarkovsky is here now, but yes, he is. the delegation that we have is super strong, and we we work really hard to get this done. Thank you. get to the questions now. I know I was a little jumping the gun on the last one there, but thank you very much. It's a good it's a good thing to have explanations of what's actually happened up there. Most time a lot of people disappear into the wind and you don't know what the heck is going on. You hear stuff from the social media and such. It's good to actually have people relaying what's actually going on, that sort of thing. Thank you very much for your efforts, sir. Uh, well, so for actually speaking on those efforts, so the first question we have is, did you file or co-sponsor any Second Amendment protection bills or any Second Amendment bills in total? Yes, I did. All of them. <coughs> so, I mean, you want specifics on which ones? I mean, I can Please. give you specifics. Oh, yes, sir. If you yes. Did. Don't worry, you're not too much on the timer on that. So you had the uh, 21 to 18 long gun bill. And by the way, Keith That's and I both co-sponsored all this stuff he's getting ready to talk about. You know, we made sure we were standing strong as an entire county on anything to do with constitutional rights. So we had that was HB 1223 that reduces the age from 21 back, I mean, re yeah. Back to 18, and and that was that was part of a bill that was the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas bill back in 17, yeah. and that's before schools were hardened off and things were put in place to, to protect schools. So that bill uh, made it through the house, off the house floor. Uh, we also uh, co-sponsored HB 17, the three-day mandatory waiting period. If if you go to purchase a gun, you have to wait three days. If if, if the government doesn't get back to you within those three days, you are authorized to pick up that weapon. And if there is a problem, you have to return it or someone's coming after you. Um, uh, HB 485, with this bill talks about if, you, if you're in some kind of if you're in an accident, let's say, and you have a weapon in your car and, you, you're the, and the police officer takes that weapon and, and it tells the, the sheriff's office or the police officer that they have to give it back to you. Good. They can't keep your weapon. That's it's your good. private property. Yep. If it wasn't used in the act of a crime, you have to get it back. Yeah, but they all died, didn't they? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> so, the, yes. But in criminal justice, we didn't just pass gun reform bills. But we passed constitutional constitutional bills such as if you're a person who molests a child 12 years or younger, 12, right? Yeah, 12 or under. 12 or Raping under. Raping a child at 12 or under, you can now be put to death in Florida. Ooh, good. good job. And we're doing the first bill. You know, that's the one thing that I want to say about Keith. Um, under his leadership in the Florida House Criminal Justice, and I got to serve on that committee, um, with Keith and, and see firsthand. Um, I, I, I just told a bunch of folks last night, we were speaking with the sheriff at an event. We literally, under Keith's leadership, we created what I call the bookends in Florida. And I got to run one of those bookend bills this session. Last session, uh, Representative Baker and Senator um, Jonathan Martin ran the bill that the governor signed that if you rape a child under 12 years old, we can now put you to death. In Lake County, Bill Gladson, our state attorney, is seeking the first death penalty case pursuant to that bill that that man produced mm -hmm. out of criminal justice and the governor signed. So we're saying in Florida, you mess with our children. We're either we're going to put you to death if you rape them. Going all the way to this session, we passed the grooming statute. We're the first state state in the nation to now have a statute that says if you're intimidating, manipulating, isolating children as a coach, as a, as a pastor, whatever's going on, a lot of family members, you don't even have to cross into a lewd and lascivious already crime. We can now convict you and, and sentence you 
to felony and put you on the sex offender list for grooming those kids and preparing them for the, for the catastrophic sexual crime that's coming, whether it be for commercial purposes or personal purposes. And that is what we did under Keith's leadership, is we said in Florida, we're the number one state now. You, there is no gray area in the shadows messing with our children. Good. And that's the best thing. We could, if, if he and I get nothing else done, that's awesome. no one will ever take that away. And Florida is a better state because of that. Yeah, totally good. Hands no. down. You have a cheerleader. <laughs> you have a cheerleader. The UK here. would really love that awesome. bill. That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, you look at... We, we set the pace for the rest of the country mm -hmm. in, in many different ways. Yeah. But I want to tell you about that bill. That bill started before before committee weeks. That bill was still being worked on the very last week of session. Mm -hmm. It took a lot of bandwidth, a lot of people, a lot of time, a lot of effort to get that bill to the landing page. That's awesome. Um, so we worked tirelessly. I mean, the last week of session, we spent... Lots of time walking back and forth from one, one house to the other. Mm -hmm. well, well, thank That's you very right. much, sir. Well, I think thanks for doing that. Indeed. Uh, thank you very much. That was a wonderful answer for it. All right. And next, uh, there's also a question. Did you file or co-sponsor any voter integrity bills, sir? Voter integrity bills, yes. New to elections and mm -hmm. such. Yeah, we, we, we passed legislation that, that tightened... Um, Voter registration. We also, we, we, the most significant thing in that to me was, you don't get a mail-in ballot anymore unless you request it. Mm -hmm. So this ballot harvesting nonsense is, is uh, put put to bed with that. Wonderful. And, well, there's a uh, what is it here? There is also. Let's see. Oh, this one. So, this one's more of a uh, local one on here, obviously, to the Second Amendment election integrity. The continued economic growth in our region is currently threatening by skyrocketing property insurance rates and ever-increasing strain on our current infrastructure and resources due to unbridled development in Lake County. What ideas could you bring to the table to, relative to these concerns? Well, I mean, in Inflation is a big is a big factor in all that. Property insurance is is a big problem. Now we didn't get here overnight. Property insurance has been a looming problem for Florida for a very long time. Citizens' property insurance was created way before we got involved. Way before some of us even remember. Nineteen ninety four. Wasn't that Charlie Chris? It was in the mid '90s, I think. Well, Chris, oh, Chris did not did, did not bring it forward, but Chris, during his administration, expanded it greatly. Mm -hmm. Which, which, it's like the housing bubble back in the late '90s. Mm -hmm. The same problem with expanding citizens is a huge problem. And currently, we had in the last year or so, we've reduced the number of. Of policies with citizens about 200,000 plus, maybe a little more than 200,000. What we need to do is reduce citizens to what it was intended for, and that's for people who couldn't get insurance. But we're all subsidizing citizens, which causes all our rates to go up because you, every, every insurance bill you have, you have a little little fee at the bottom of it. So citizens itself has to be has to be worked on. I mean it. it it's one of those elephants in the room that that has to be dealt with. The, well, the good thing is seven seven new companies have been introduced in the state of Florida in the last six months, and they bring about 1.25 billion in in assets to cover some of these policies that are being taken away from citizens. So we're we're getting to where we depopulate citizens with the new new. Uh, New insurance companies coming in. Are they funded though? Yeah, they're funded. Like, they, I went through that, and they weren't funded, and the company collapsed after they couldn't pay out. Uh, Th there's been a bunch, there's been a lot of those for sure. There's and that been was a lot that have citizens that did that. Well, we did some other things this year as well. Uh, my safe Florida home. You know, we we in 22 to 23 we put 44 point now. Four hundred and thirty-three million in funding increase to uh, harden your homes. In twenty-four, we we put some more money in that two hundred thousand. 
and also we increased hurricane and windstorm resiliency statewide and then we increased the number of homes that qualify. So you have to qualify for the program to get get those those funds, those grant funds, but we see a reduction in the insurance cost because of that. The insur the reinsurance folks love it too because now they see a they see that hardening off of these these homes as a reduction in cost and payouts, right? So if something does happen it's not going to be as destructive as um, as it could have been. But we go back to last year, 22-23, the tort reform package that was passed was monumental. I mean, we had a bill, we call it the omnibus bill, that went through and we had hundreds of attorneys file as lobbyists against the bill. But we passed a bill that will change the outcome of insurance for decades. Now, it's going to take a little while to trickle down. I mean, they filed probably 200,000 lawsuits the day before the bill was signed. Mm -hmm. We are the highest state in the union for the number of property insurance lawsuits, right? 70% of all first-party property insurance litigation in the nation, 70% comes out of Florida. Whoa. In the entire nation. So that, that has reduced about almost 10% so far in just a short period of time since, since the insurance reform or the tort reform bills were passed. Reinsurance, uh, Florida has boosted the Florida reinsurance program. We've, we've set aside money in that. The uh, reinsurance assistant, assist policyholders policy program. Um, the Florida Optional Reinsurance Assistant Program as well. Um, the market has responded. We, we see reinsurance purchases or, or, or the monies come down by 10 to 15 percent. It's not a big help to most of us. I mean, hey, I'm in the same boat. My, my insurance on my house doubled. Doubled. And my house is two years old. If I didn't have a mortgage on my house, I'd go with liability and, and, and forget the rest because I know my house is built to the code that it needs to be. But we're paying for all that destruction that's happened over the last five to seven years. And hopefully we get past, get, get to some, some calmer times and then that, that will relax a little bit. Um, claim mediation. Um, we expect to see reduction in litigation increases like I talked about. Um, the other problem, the other market factors that we, you know, weather, we talked about the hurricanes, inflation, we talked about inflation early on in this conversation. It's caused a lot of different things to happen and, and of course on insurance and, and that and it's got the same effect. Home values, home values have increased 80% in the last five years or thereabouts, which increases your premium. When your reconstruction costs and and everything else, if, you're, if your home is valued for more money, you're going to want to have it insured for more money because you know it's going to cost more money to get it fixed. And then, you know, litigation, like we were talking about, has reduced about 7 to 10 percent in the last year. Now, I don't have all the solutions. I don't. It's a sticky widget, and I mean it's a very complicated thing. But we do have, we've got to reduce mm -hmm. citizens to a point where we get free market access to to, mark, to to insurance companies because they don't want to come here when they have to compete against citizens who have set fees, reduced fees for agents, reduced fees for all kinds of things that make it more attractive, right? And at the end. It, Citizens is more attractive. We can't make it more attractive. I know it's a hard thing, but you know, folks live on the coast. They they live with uh, knowing that they they are exposed to more than we are. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we're we're in the middle of the state. We should have the lowest rates. Yeah, they should. But we're paying for those folks on the outside. So we got to reduce the number of policies that are in citizens. How we get there, it's it's being worked on. We're not going to stop till we get some things done. I mean, we've, made, we've chipped away at it, like we talked about chipping away at things. We've chipped away at it. We haven't gotten the answer. I'm not happy with it. 
I'm, I'm going to continue to work on insurance. It, Keith, the answer is fraud. <laughs> the answer is fraud. I was with an insurance company for 20 years. Bottom line is, just like we were saying back here, um, you know, it's all about the attorneys. Well, and, and so it's going back to attorneys, attorneys, you're right. So one-way attorney's fees, uh, frivolous lawsuits, all, a lot of those things were in that <laughs> omnibus bill. So that stuff's going to take effect. Mm -hmm. I mean, even on car insurance, you have to report a claim within 14 days. Mm -hmm. A lot of these frivolous lawsuits are going to subside. Yeah. And as they do, just like, I don't know if you guys are in, own a business in Florida, but if you go back to the early 2000s, workman's comp was horrendous in mm -hmm. Florida. Mm -hmm. And it took us chipping away at it for 15 years to get the rates down. Mm -hmm. And we're finally there. Now, they went down again this year. I mean, we have to take the same approach like we talked about his bill. It took us all session mm -hmm. to get it done. We'll, we'll keep chipping away at this until we get a better solution. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's, it's really incredible when you get to Tallahassee and get on the inside, and Keith and I being businessmen, Senator Baxley, you know, we, didn't, we all started from nothing, and we've, we've built where, where we are today, which is a skill set that we have. That others don't necessarily, but what's interesting to me as I got into Tallahassee and really started getting behind the curtain, if you will, and seeing what's really going on, the majority of all the problems that we deal with in Tallahassee are because we made a decision in the past to stick our nose into the free market mm -hmm. and mess with free market mm -hmm. principles, mm -hmm. and now we're trying to backpedal and fix problems that just have compounded and compounded. Mm -hmm. And you ask any of the carriers, like she'll tell you, why are we on this insurance crisis? Well, if they would have stayed the hell out of the free market back in the 90s and early 2000s, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have created this problem. Mm -hmm. and, and it's happening again. I see it happening with credit unions trying to weasel their way into conventional banking. That's, again, another quasi-governmental protection that we're now empowering that doesn't help free market and it doesn't help um, our freedoms in general. So I think that's the thing that we look at is, is this free market stuff and are we trying to stick our nose into the, into the legal system, into the free market system where we don't belong? And that's honestly the precipice of a lot of what we're dealing with in Tallahassee. Well, thank you very much, sir. It is a wonderful answer on that, uh, obviously. If there is a little bit more on there, just so you know, we're trying to keep it so that way you don't have the ability to answer all the questions. So we'll just go for a five-minute limit on that sort of thing. But it was a good conversation. That's why I was like, oh, wow. I was like, I want to stop them, but I don't really. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, so the next question that we have is about the uh, Live Local Act. So uh, if you could, if you are aware of it, sir. Uh, so if you could explain what the Live Local Law is and if it is a benefit or a detriment to the locality of Lake County. Well, I, I think there's a lot of good parts in the Live Local Act. But there are some things in the Live Local Act that I think we need to address. And I think we'll be addressing this in the future post-haste. I mean, I think that uh, some of these uh, property, uh, property tax issues that are, are within that bill uh, give too long of a term and it's just a little confusing on, you know, the exemption from property taxes on, on some of those buildings that can be built or, or exist already. So I think we're going to have to take a look at some of that, uh, how we do apartment complexes and, and where we put those in the future. I, I don't know the answer 100%, but I know there's, there's issues we've talked about this year that we're trying to work on. We're just trying to let some of that stuff play out and see who the bad actors are because, you know, sometimes we put a piece of policy in place and we really don't know what the cause and effect is 100%, but we, I think that we'll, uh, we'll be working that. I, I think he left out points that I made, which is that these developers don't have to warn anybody and then come in and build something and then the neighbors don't even know it and bam, all of a sudden they've got a maximum height building with maximum density without any requirement to look at road issues or anything else. Yeah, that, and that's a good point. I mean, and like that's I said, what they, needs to be they, looked at. I, I agree. Tavares already had a developer threaten them with that, yeah. and uh, they're facing and, now. And they're, and they're rightfully issue. so. They can do it under this bill. So there are things to be worked on for sure. 
I mean, there were some places that needed the help of this bill, you know, such places like Miami-Dade and different uh, high-density areas that they could repurpose some some uh, light industrial land for for use in, in housing. But you're yeah, right, we don't need that here. So we need to make that a priority moving forward. Well, that knocked out about three cards. Thank you very much, Mr. Vance. <laughs> right, that one got on there. All right, so uh, let's see here. There's another one on here. So we have... So I'm trying to keep them obviously in a kind of logical order on the conversation that we have. But since we have this sort, uh, so regarding the local justice and court system, they are currently out of control, allowing opposing attorneys to constantly make costly motions and bankrupting parties. For example, a child custody lawsuit to run to five to ten years and not paying the court costs borne by the taxpayers. What can you do to possibly alleviate that situation as it comes around, sir? Well, I think that uh, that's a question I don't know a lot about at this time, but I mean, if, if there's real issues that need to be dealt with, we need to bring them forward and then find, find some people that can help us with the answer. But yeah, I mean, I will say this, you know, as a representative or even as a business owner, you know, at 23 years old, I went to work for Ellis Wilkinson, right? I didn't know a whole lot about a lot of things. At 23, you're pretty young. You don't have a lot of experience. You don't know how to make some of the decisions you need to make. But someone found it in, in me to hire me to be a general manager. So I said, well, how am I going to accomplish this? Well, I accomplish this by surrounding myself with people who know more than I do. Mm -hmm. And I got through what I needed to get through. And I do the same here. So as a representative, I surround myself with people that get the job done. Eric Ramundo, my legislative aide, and Aileen Guy, the secretary, they work diligently to make sure that issues like this issue gets brought to my attention so that we can address them and go over them and make, make common sense or the need, needs necessary to take care of the problem. My door is always open, has been always. Mm -hmm. I know some folks call me on my cell phone a lot of times, but I was just a little busy guy in that Florida house. Mm -hmm. And I also have a family and I also have a business, so I, I have lots of things going on. So sometimes I don't answer my cell phone when people call me, but I have Aileen and I have Eric. And those people work diligently to make sure that any constituent questions that arise were taken care of. And, and dealt with. I mean, we, we are here to serve. They're like my right arm and my left arm. I mean, they really worked well with me to get things done. They left no stone unturned. Having worked with them, they are top notch. Mm -hmm. If they don't know the answer, or Keith doesn't know the answer, they admit it and know where to find the answer. Mm -hmm. And that's what's important. And I'll say this one right for you, sir. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right, so next up there is a, uh, let's see here, so that one's in hieroglyphics, so I will pass that on for a little bit before I can read it. All right, so uh, this one I can read pretty well. well uh, so Florida does not mandate an independent county-level inspector generals to improve, uh, did you read this one? Whoa, that one, yeah. That one's a little bit on there. Seems I've been running into there. I need my reading glasses. Oversight. 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 Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but well, say there was, a, there was a sideways W on there. I was very concerned. <laughs> All right. To improve oversight over county, city spending, and productivity, what will you do to improve operational audit oversight on county, city, school, and constitutional offices? Well, we have this little thing called JLAC. It's a judge advocate general. They, they do more than you think. But, so, any time that there's a question with that, we have the ability to, to file a report with the, the general and, and get those things done. So it's in place. There's a, there's a way to do it. I mean, cities across the state have been audited. You know, they're not, they're not out to shut them down. They're out to fix their problems. They're out to figure out why they're doing things wrong, what 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 steps they need to make to correct their activities and, and make it better for the citizens. All right, so this one is a bit of a different one on this, a more personal one. Of the, I think you kind of answered it, but if you could just uh, reiterate it. Why don't you attend Republican events and meetings inside of Lake County? Well, 
Well, I, I attend a lot of Republican events, maybe not inside of Lake County as a whole, but, you know, being in Tallahassee and standing here and, and doing the things that you all wanted me to do, I, I devote more than my part-time job in this job, in this role. I, I devote my whole time to this. I put this job over a lot of things, and a lot of times, sometimes, but I, I say families first, but my wife would beg to differ. Uh, she would say that I, I do more at this job than I should, and I should, be, I should do some more. But also, you know, we have to think about what, what is, what do you need for me? I mean, I, I'm accessible, my, my folks are accessible, if you have policy ideas or concerns, I'm, that's what I'm here for. For your grassroots Republican Party, mm -hmm. yes, you're here to help find the next candidate or the candidates mm -hmm. that will help us mm -hmm. do exactly what I've been doing. Absolutely. Do exactly what Representative Yarkovsky's been doing. Yeah. And have the time and the experience and the know-how, the integrity to do so. I think that integrity with purpose, not just words, not just sound bites, not just if I'm, I'll, I, I don't care if I'm on TV. I don't care if I'm on the news for negative attacks or positive outflow. What I'm here for is to get the job done, the policy job that you all expect to get done. And that's, to me, is important. Now, I share what I do on social media. Eric and, and Annie and I put together stuff that we've been doing for you guys to follow. The door's open in Tallahassee. Some of you have come to Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. You've sat in my office, talked to me about issues. A lot of people don't come to Tallahassee. That's right. Um, a lot of people don't come to my door in, in my office, which is right here in, in Tavares. So not far away. You can always come ask for me to talk to me. But, yeah, this is not just a part-time job to me. It's a full-time job, and I take it serious. Well, thank you very much for it, sir. All right. Uh, so speaking on your priorities and such, what is, when you are elected, what would be your number one priority and why? Well, I will continue the priorities that we have set forth in the legislature in the last four years. Like I said, we're going to tick away at making things better every day. I'm not going to change my MO. I'm here for the family farmer. I'm here for agriculture. I'm here to protect the environment. I'm here for businesses to stay open. I'm here for <coughs> families and children and all the things under the sun. We, we touch every aspect of life in the legislature. That's why we're number one in this country. Mm -hmm. That's why we lead in every which way. doesn't matter. We're making headway in, in all aspects. And I'm engaged with all of my members. I'm engaged with... Representative Yarkoski, and I'm engaged with the Senate. The reason why the things that I, I think the reason why you guys want me to be doing this is because I have created those relationships which get the job done. Mm -hmm. And I want to continue to do that. Wonderful. Thank you very much, sir. How many do we have left, Jeremiah? Uh, we have approximately a lot. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. uh, about six. Term. Six in total. Okay. If you're all right with continuing on on that sort of thing. We understand you have a busy schedule, sir. What do we have next? Do we have to be somewhere? I mean, good answers, though, nonetheless. So we appreciate the time that you have. Yes, yeah. do so you have a uh, board meeting with Lake County Fair at 1.30? Okay. So we'll get you out here yeah. before lunch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, so the next one is President Trump says that he often has saved the farmers of America $28 billion. Do you, have, do you know where that money has gone to help Florida farmers? And if so, can you possibly explain what you would do to help farmers in your end? So, uh, that's something I can really talk about, right? So I grow grass and I've grown vegetables up and, and raised chickens and everything else under the sun. I've done so many things I can't even count. My first job as an adult was at 11 years old. When I was old enough to hold a five pound scoop and feed chickens, I got up every morning before I went to school. I fed 40,000 chickens. My brother Mark fed the other 40,000 chickens. And we would go to school and come back and do it again. Oh, that's a lot of chickens. Seven days a week, right? I fed 40, he fed 40. So 80,000. Hand feed, hand pick. 
So moving on as I go along, I, I got on the turf grass producers of Florida board. And I sat on that board for 19 years. I was vice president for nine years and president for three years. 2017 came along. Hurricane Irma. You know, it went right up the state from one end to the other. Caused a lot of damage and destruction. As the president, I think at the time, I think I was, I was maybe just past president, President Trump, Sonny Perdue, Secretary of Agriculture for the USDA, Adam Putnam. I get them all on the phone at the same time. They're in a meeting somewhere. And we're talking about the destruction that we had in the agriculture. And we secured, after those meetings and getting the data together, we secured about 2.3 or 2.4 billion dollars to restore farms in Florida after that hurricane. So my efforts, President Trump's efforts, Agriculture in Florida is a little strange when it comes to subsidies. We don't get a lot of subsidies. We have a lot of specialty crops in Florida. So we don't, we don't have that same ability as a Midwestern farmer. So we have to fight for what we get mm -hmm. and uh, we'll continue to fight. That's an easy fight for me. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Uh, this one is actually a poignant one that came from a little bit beforehand. So we have currently a supermajority of Republicans in the uh, House. Is that correct, sir? Yes, we do. All right. And so, the Senate. And the Senate as well. And the Senate. So if we can, so what is the point of a Republican supermajority if we cannot get more Second Amendment and election integrity bills over that finish line? Obviously, we understand it's a very complicated <coughs> thing, but some people do feel that there is, even though a supermajority exists. A little bit of pushback for some unknown reason. Can you explain that, sir? Well, yeah, you, you've got 120 members in the House, and you have 140 members in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And you have a Speaker of the House, and you have a President of the Senate. In this last, in this last cycle, you saw that, you know, we passed a lot more of those bills through the House. So the decision-making in the House was a little different than the Senate. You saw in the in the Senate, and you know, everybody comes from a different walk of life, right? I mean, we got Republicans that are, you know, moderate Republicans. We got mm -hmm. some Republicans that are farther right. But it's the balance. I mean, I, you know, nothing, hard decisions have to come with a lot of deliberation. Mm -hmm. And we just didn't see the Senate in that same posture. But we have a great opportunity right now. We have five seats, five Republican seats in the, in the Senate that are coming, most of those people are coming from the House. Mm -hmm. So you see, you see a change coming, um, and, a, and a, I would like to be part of that change. Good. Very good. Wonderful. Thank you very much, sir. All right. Uh, this one will be for education. What will you do to improve funding and reduce regulations over K-12 through school districts in Florida? That's a little complicated. Just a hair, just a hair. <laughs> so, you know, as this this county grows, you know, they grow, they they grow in <coughs> the the algorithm that creates what they get. As as you get better and more prosperous in a county, you get less, right? Because you you have within the county to support the school system better. And those more rural counties get a bigger number, right? So. It's difficult, but I would say that in totality, in these last four years that I've served in the House, we have improved the K through 12 and all of it, even even the uh, Votech and Lake Sumter State College. I mean, we are we won't change our MO. We will continue to make those strides to make it better. Uh, the next one is a little more uh, to everyone's uh, dismay, unfortunately. Lake County traffic gridlock is terrible, which I can attest to. Yeah, well, I would like to blame anybody that comes from New York area. I know that that's not actually the truth. It's just the unfortunate plate that was in front of me at the time. But what will you do to reduce development until the road infrastructure has capacity for the current and then the future population of Lake County? Well, I don't know that I'm going to deter the growth. You know, people have, people that own property have rights just like everyone in this room. 
So in the policies that are already written for those rights. Um, you know, the, that's up to the county. Most of that's the county level or the city levels. They, they can do things to, to curb growth on their own. Um, but I think we've done a lot of things. Mm -hmm. As a state, I'll give you an example. We got a, we got a bypass going in Grover. It wasn't scheduled until after 2030. We got it moved up to 2026. So that bypass is funded and ready to go, and we, we moved it up on the ladder. Uh, Representative Yarkoski and myself and, and Senator Baxley moved that up on the list. Those are things we're going to get done from the state level that matter to us. And we have those discussions with DOT about what do we think what do we think we need in in state roads moving forward in, in Lake County and, and we're we're having those discussions regular. The DOT secretary and I have a good relationship. Alright. Uh, so this next one is bringing experience to bear. Having been a member of the state delegation for four years under the leadership of Senator Baxley how can that experience benefit not just you, but also the citizens of District 13? In other words, what specific advantages do you have as a freshman senator that your opponents will not enjoy? Well, I'm a farmer, number one. The next president of the Senate will be a, is a farmer. Senator Ben Albritton is a farmer from Wachula. He's a citrus farmer and many other things. So. We we have a we have a relationship that is pretty deep, so that puts me in a very very good position moving forward, because I bring that level of experience to the Senate that will encourage all the things we talked about here today. But on a a, a, a faster track, um, again, like I said. The experiences that I've had in the House, the, the successes, give me responsibility. They already know what I can do. They already know what they're going to have me do. And it's not going to be sitting around twiddling my thumbs waiting for the next move. They're all, they already have it scripted. They already know what they need me to do. So with that, I will say this, Senator Baxley. I would say the one thing I get from him more than anything is he is a very good encourager. You can sit in his office and talk about issues and have dilemmas and have woes or concerns and he'll sit there and help you figure out how to get to the next level. He's been great at it. So he's been the calm, collective, uh, president pro tem. He's been great. He's been a great man. He's. I mean, come on, let's, let's look back at his time in the House himself. Where do you think Stand Your Ground came from? Mm -hmm. It was Baxley. Nice. It was Baxley. Yeah. That's nice. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's a good I mean, tour. we have a delegation over the years that have stood up for people, mm -hmm. real people. And he stood up for, for children with disabilities yeah. through the years. In my appropriations, in the last couple of years, we've done numerous children's functions for children with disabilities. Beacon College got some money, Jonathan Lanning got some money, Special Hearts Farms, all, all kinds of things that we, we talk about bringing all these young people into the world, all these newborns. Well, you know, you know what that does. You're going you're gonna to end up with folks that have needs beyond normal. That's right. And we got to be ready for all that. Yeah. And, and I'm going to take that torch that Senator Baxley had, and I'm going to carry that with me. Good, good. Yeah, he's a very good Wonderful. Leader. Thank you very yeah. much, sir. Uh, the gentleman that just left is married to the mayor of Howie in the Hills, and he just wanted to state that they're working very hard over there to get you elected. Well, thank you. Wonderful. Well, I wish they'd finish Highway 19. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they have to work for that. Yeah. <laughs> they'd fix the that. traffic. <laughs> All right, so this will be the last question, and it is a very technical question. Well, not a technical question on there, but it is a very uh, specific question on there. So Senate Bill 1295, it is a homeowners association's bill. Are you familiar with it at all, sir? Uh, 
there's been so many. What what was the particulars? Uh, so if you if you may, sir, especially on that. Yes, this was a bill that was uh, done by. Um, I don't remember the name, but it was a bill uh, that was um, B S B twelve ninety six to create a uh, ombudsman uh, a body that can investigate homeowners associations uh, problems For fraud that people yeah. have. millions of people are living mm -hmm. in homeowners associations yeah. mm -hmm. and we have too many too many mm -hmm. problems. Yes. Yeah. And this bill was a very important bill that was uh, done by Mr. Burgess, I think. Yeah, Danny um, Burgess, Senator yes, Burgess. Burgess, yeah. And this went to um, the committee and then they did not uh, uh, bring yeah, the bill for a vote. Okay, so, so that does happen, right? Um, I had a bill right to the last week, myself, made it through second reading on the Senate floor, made it to the third reading for a vote, never made it. Now. We, we only have so much time, mm -hmm. and, you know, we have, the House is a house of ideas, and the Senate has a lot less people and a lot more to do. That's when they go to die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Awesome. That's when they go to die. So, that, that bill won't die. That bill will come back next year. Thank you. It will. You. Because what we understand is that there are so many lobbyists that are being paid by the, the management companies, and they are lobbying in Tallahassee. Try to stop this that, kind of bill. That's a good bill. So, I think it passed off the house. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it was coming. Yeah. But, uh, it was coming. I can't remember who ran the bill on that. Was Representative, it? how many bills are filed and how many actually pass? Wow. So, average bills that pass are in the 200s, maybe. Um, the bills that are filed, where there's 120 members in the house and they all have the ability to pass or, or sponsor seven. So 120 times 7, 840. That, and that doesn't count all the appropriations bills or committee bills or, you know, there's all, all kinds of different kinds of bills. So yes, we don't have time for everything. And staff, I mean, they work a lot. My Staff in my silo, they're sometimes there till midnight. Yeah, I mean, they, they work hard. So yes, we don't get through it all, but you know, not that we don't want good bills to pass, because we do. It's part of the process. Yeah, unfortunately, so, um, we are. I, what my research shows that uh, most of the homeowners associations, board of directors, they come from outside. Most of the Democrats have taken the power in that, mm -hmm. that area, and the homeowners are not very happy. No. So we need a good bill like this because DBPR. It's not even taking complaints. They take 90 days to investigate and another 90 days to, you know, have an interview and yeah, people are in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, well, we have a lot of a lot of folks over 65 in this state that we have to take care of. That's right. And fraud That's right. is... Yes, please. Fraud, the fraud, yes. Is, oh, fraud no. is rampant, so we yes, have to... Yes, yes. I mean, we, we hear about it up there all the time, about mm -hmm. phone calls trying wow. to get you to do a new internet or this or that and people yeah. getting taken for, for hundreds of dollars. Very yes. educated people. Yes. These are very intelligent people. I mean, we can't even keep up with them all. There's so many right. people trying to fraud yeah. folks. Yeah. And, well, and most of us don't think like a criminal. Right. That's the thing. Okay. I have to agree. Is it on right? Paper on this on paper? <laughs> Your opponent. All three of them have no experience in Tallahassee. Two of them are total political neophytes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what kind of time frame would it take for them just to get up to speed as to how things work? I mean, you're talking about, you, you said 120 House members and 40 senators. To me, that translates into three times the responsibility, three times the work, and three times more the than that. complexity. Yeah. Right. You, want, you know why it's more than that? Yeah. Because there's only 27 Republican senators in the, in the, in the Senate. Uh, so you actually get uh -huh. 
probably six times yeah. the yeah. amount of work. I, I just don't understand how somebody can have absolutely no political experience whatsoever and, and run for, that for a position. seat like state senate. Well, it, it is tr it is troubling. I mean, and that's one of the things that really caused me to to run in the first place. You know. When I looked at the Florida House when I ran, the average age was 35 years old. And not that those people aren't good people that are young. They, they have drive. They have charisma. They have uh, can-do attitude. They have all those things. And they're good people. But when you don't have the experience, good or bad, successes or failures, most of the failures are the best, best uh, learning experiences for me and everybody here probably. Because we learned not, hopefully, not to do it twice. <laughs> but yeah, that was one of my things that that I ran on was the fact that you know I was 50 at the time and I'll be 55 this year. Um, I, I want to use me on a fast track to getting things done because I, I I've run a business with a lot of folks and we've done a lot of things and we I've grown I grew a business from seven employees to 200 over my time and that's not 200 just 200 employees that's 200 families mm -hmm. that's people that I care about yep. and a lot of those people still work there yeah. you know some people have been there 20 30 years yeah. you know beyond before I even started the business yeah. I, I they came with me so yeah experience is key mm -hmm. and I and I you know civic duty civic service um, being on the Lake County Fair Board being a member of the of the Turf Grass Association, being a member of Florida Turf Grass Association, all kinds of things. Being a member of Farm Bureau, being a member helping the youth in this county with Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts, and, mm -hmm. and and putting my time in where 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 you need to be putting your time in. You need to be mentoring these young people, 4-H, FFA, with with agriculture. Uh, activities that are going with the fair. Yep. All these things, you, you, these people need to have that vested time, giving of the time where you, you don't get it back, you don't get paid for it, you don't, but those experiences help you focus on what you need to do. Having children, when I, my first two years in the house, I sat on early learning and pre-K through 12. Yep. I did that for a reason. I have two kids, I watched them grow up, I watched them grow up with, with teachers Two different teachers early on, and I see a total difference between the two teachers. Mm -hmm. And I see what happened to my two kids. Mm -hmm. One of them just skated right on, man. He had it, never had a problem. He never got a B until he was in ninth grade, mm -hmm. right? And then my second child, he had a teacher that was had had issues, right? And he struggled until he got to about sixth or seventh grade. Mm -hmm. He had to actually work at his academics because he those fundamental things that didn't happen early on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. didn't allow him to expand fast yeah. so in in pre-k through 12 and early learning we passed lots of great legislations mm -hmm. the book reading legislation you know to make sure the kids get up to speed on, on on their reading levels we did so many things I can't even think of them now but I was part of all of that and not if you don't have children how do you know? How do you know what you're going to do or how you're going to react to something mm -hmm. if you've never experienced it? That's so right. yes, I believe the experiences that we, we go through in life help us to make better decisions. Yeah. If you own property, you own a home, you have more responsibility in yourself. If you have children, you understand the family unit. That's right. And, and, and family to me is everything. Mm -hmm. I pay attention to my kids all the time. Now, they make mistakes just like all kids. But at the same time, I'm there to help them figure out how what the path is moving forward so they can make better decisions for themselves. Yeah. You know they want to because as they grow up, and then I got, by you, put me in this spot. My kids were becoming young adults. They didn't need me every single day like they did when they, when they, they were younger. But this has been a learning process for them too. They've learned from what I'm doing and learned how we need to be engaged. We need to vote. If you don't vote, don't talk. That's right. But if you vote, you get engaged. Mm -hmm. You understand that, that that's your right. Mm -hmm. Somebody said something about it the other day on my flyer. It said, 
God-given constitutional rights, right? Mm -hmm. Somewhere on there it said that. I got an email about it. What, what have I done for God-given constitutional rights? What, what haven't I done? Mm -hmm. Almost everything I've done in the legislature for the last four years is about the blessing that we all have. Amen. That we have in the preamble to the Constitution, it talks about blessings. In, in the Declaration of Independence, it talks about the Creator. Mm -hmm. It's in the Constitution. And if people don't utilize what, what has been written and why it's been written, it's a problem. So, look, I, I, I base myself on, on, on family, on God, and, and country, and I just hope I can do the best job I can for you. So if you'll, if you'll uh, send me back up there for the Senate, I'd appreciate it. Will you be willing to stand up to leadership when they're really messing it up? Yes, ma'am. Like Pasadomo did last time? Yes, ma'am. And I have those hard conversations all the time. And when I walk into a room and I know I'm going to speak to leadership, I sit down and I say, hey, i got to have a hard conversation with you. Mm -hmm. okay. Don't get mad. Yeah. Because we work on the issue.